what is an archive? An archive is best described, I think, as a collective memory bank. If you want to understand how you got here, if you want to understand the world that you live in today, then you need to understand the background. And that's what the archive, the written record, gives you. I'm going to take you through to the strong rooms of the Archive Centre. How do the papers of David Maxwell Fife fit in with the rest of the archive? What the archive here is trying to do is to build up a body of material um, that um, will allow future generations of researchers to study um, the modern era. And one of the great strengths of the archive is that it brings together a number of different perspectives. So it's bringing together the views of different politicians, civil servants, diplomats, military leaders and scientists. And of course, your great-grandfather is an integral part of that. And I'll just unwrap this first folder here. And what you're looking at here are actually David Maxwell Fife's school reports and school certificates from his time at Edinburgh at the beginning of the 20th century. Memory is a highly selective instrument. Looking back, the years of manhood present themselves in a kind of opaque mist in which certain events stand out clearly, in much the manner that the sun picks out individual landmarks on a fitful summer day. Within a day or two of my appointment as Attorney General on May the 28th, 1945, I went to Claridge's to have my first conversation with Mr Justice Jackson, who had been commissioned by President Truman to deal with the problem on behalf of the United States. It was no simple problem that faced us in our early talks. There were a number of choices open to us. One was to select the defendants and to give them a hearing. In such event, natural justice demanded that we should inform them clearly what the charges were against them, produce to them the evidence in which these charges were based, and to give them a full opportunity of answering them. This was a view strongly advocated by Jackson and myself. <laughs>
On October the 24th, I flew to Nuremberg. I did not think it would be nearly a year before I finally returned. Jackson made a really superb speech, and the American case is beginning well, with one or two dull patches. And so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations flushed with victory. I have come to the point where I shall content myself with reading a sentence from the Treaty of Versailles, if only I can get the totality of the case reasonably well presented. When it is finished, I shall either retire and cultivate my garden and my life of Percival, or else make a comeback to politics like a political atomic bomb, releasing the pent-up wish to tell people exactly what I think of them. The interesting thought was to look back 10 years and wonder what we should have said if anyone had foretold that in 10 years I should be proposing the health of the Red Army in a conquered and shattered Nuremberg. Darling, this is from the plane, just to say I'm thinking of you and all we have done, and I shall add a letter from the ground when I get home. I know you understand and feel the same about not saying much when one says goodbye, so I do not worry that I should have said more. If we dislike something very much, we've always said as little as possible. However, I can now picture your life and surroundings, which make them seem less remote, and we are on the last lap. I hope and pray it will not be too arduous for you. But I am now completely satisfied that you are making history in a real way and without any self-seeking. You will get a reward. Yesterday I went to a preview of the Russian film on Auschwitz concentration camp. When one sees children of Mo's age and younger in this horrible place and the clothes of infants who were killed, it is worth a year of our lives to register forever and with practical result the reasoned horror of humanity.
actually, he, Goering, is extremely clever, very calm, factual, and a little dull. Jackson is going to start his cross-examination. The oddity about his attempts so far is that they have no form and no follow-up, but a wealth of carefully prepared material. Curiously enough, for the effete old country, I get the impression that I have been brought up in a much harder and tougher school. Now the escape about which I am asking you took place on the night of the 24th to the 25th of March. I want you to get that date in March. The decision to murder these young officers must have been taken very quickly because the first murder which actually took place on the 26th of March, you agree with that? I think that my cross-examination of Goering went off all right. Everyone here was very pleased. Jackson had not only made no impression, but actually built the fat boy up further. I think I knocked him reasonably off his perch. Did you hear the extract on the BBC News last night? No, no, we're, we're finished with that document now. We're going on to this, uh, the murder of these young men. The... Uh, a gross fandom, a general hue and cry, I think would be the English translation, was also issued at once in order that these men should be arrested. Is that so? Darling. It's a glorious day with bright sun and flowers coming out in the park, so perhaps this long, long winter is going to end sometime. Also, the Times and Telegraph, and doubtless all the papers, say that your cross-examination went beautifully. In a few skilful questions, the Times says, I fear Mr Justice Jackson felt a little out of it. Some corner of a foreign field that 
Norman Burkett went to immense trouble to get me a copy of the Northern Muse. A selection of Scottish poetry made by John Buchan. Incidentally, he put in it an inscription of which I am very proud. From his friend Norman Burkett to commemorate days at Nuremberg and some superb examples of the great art of cross-examination. Why I really mention it, I swear, you believe me, thousands wouldn't, is for Norman's favourite poem, which rather expresses our mood just now. I saw Hilary at the speakers, and he told me he was doing a talk, but was not allowed to mention horrors. We really are all mad. What do they think this trial was about? Going let out rather a good crack to the psychiatrist, I'm told by the press. He said, Of course, I know Sir David's technique now. I can see the way he works up to his point. It was very bad luck on me coming first and being cross-examined before I had a chance to observe. I must say, I take off my boots to the old brigand. He keeps his interest up. It seems most necessary to get some anti-Nazi propaganda about. Everyone seems to have forgotten, and coming fresh from all its surroundings as I have done, I cannot believe people can forget so fast. We must never look the other way again. Jackson leaves tomorrow or Wednesday. He gave a party tonight, and I have had the great pleasure of talking to Madame Falco on my bad side, which has been a rat of fun. Anyway, it is a sign that the thing is packing up, which is all I care about. I do not think of politics or the bench or anything except getting back to you. suggested that I take the afternoon off, and I did so. And as my car did not come at once, I walked by myself along the main street outside the court. It was a most eerie sensation having nothing to do. Moreover, it was the second time since I arrived that I'd walked aimlessly in Nuremberg, and the first time that I'd done it alone. Last November, Harry and I walked down to the Pegnitz and back at lunchtime. We have finished our work on the organisations, including the speech. It is not, as I said, a publicity finder, but it covers the ground. It's not merely the quantity of horrors. Although these organisations have been the instruments of death for 22 million people, it is the quality of cruelty which produced the gas chambers of Auschwitz or the routine shooting of Jewish children throughout a continent claiming to be civilized. There is not one of these organizations which is not directly connected with the solid trade of murder in a brutal form. Who can doubt the right cabinet knew of the euthanasia used to conserve the physical resources of Germany for war? It is beyond question that the high command and general staff passed on these orders of which you have heard so much, and which are all reduced in the end to plain murder. It might be presumptuous of lawyers who did not claim to be more than the cement of society to speculate or even dream of what we wish to see in place of the Nazi spirit. But I give you the faith of a lawyer. Some things are surely universal. Tolerance, decency, kindliness, when such qualities have been given the chance to vanish in the ground that you have cleared, a great step will have been taken. It will be a step towards the universal recognition that sights and sounds all happy as a day, and laughter learned to friends, and gentleness and hearts at peace are not the prerogative of any one nation. They are the inalienable 
global heritage of mankind. Most people approach the subject of war crimes trials fundamentally either as cynic or idealist. This is, I think, because in essence the case for or against trying war criminals depends on the controversial subject which has become succinctly known as human rights. Your cynic says, human rights, there are none. Your idealist, however, takes the view that there are certain rights and freedoms not created by lawyers, but to which mankind as such are heir, and which cannot be alienated. The idea of fundamental human rights is one in which I firmly believe. One day in 1947, Winston called to me across the smoking room of the House of Commons and asked me if I would join the committee of the United Europe Movement, of which he was chairman. I had always been anxious to do something positive after the part I had played in destroying Nazi ideology, and I accepted with enthusiasm. I wanted to do something about human rights. There is in each of us a sundial factor of our mentality. We are inclined only to count the sunny hours. Moreover, after exhausting wars, men tend to suffer a weariness of mind. This lassitude can make them shrink away from facing the limitations of human nature. It can produce a facile scepticism about their evil deeds. New generations dislike reading the history of gas chambers and so the fact that men claiming to be civilized put millions to death in the gas chambers slip from history. Our draft had as its basis security for life and limb, freedom from arbitrary arrest, freedom from slavery and compulsory labor, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of marriage, the sanctity of the family, equality before the law, and freedom from arbitrary deprivation of property. After that we spent nearly two hours drafting subjects including human rights. If the Council of Foreign Ministers do not take it after the Assembly has approved, as I believe it will, we are going to have a magnificent row about the rights of the Assembly as well as the rights of man. I cannot think what made the ministers reject it.
if I must label what I believe, I think I could best describe it as the faith of a romantic. By romance, I don't mean sentimentality or foolish optimism, but some idealism, an imaginative perception, a pervading sense of tradition, and a strong consciousness of the adventure of living. By tradition, I mean a sense of unity, not only with the past, but with those who share the past. Shared achievements, shared misfortune, and above all shared sacrifice, nourish the virtues which I consider most important, loyalty, tolerance, and understanding. For the faith of a romantic is poles apart from that perfectionism which says that if you adopt someone else's panacea for life, government, or economics, all problems will disappear. He can't see Christianity as a release from the problems of the world. His belief that the God who made the world came into the world and died to save it accentuates rather than lessens his own responsibility. I know that my faith receives many pitying smiles from the cynic, and the intellectual. Yet I know no other that can help me in what I believe to be my most important task, namely to try to secure that in the second half of our mad century the spiritual stature of man will approximate to his material and scientific advances. Those were the beliefs of Sir David Maxwell Fife. Sir David Maxwell Fife is Conservative Member of the British Parliament. He has been a member of Parliament since 1935. He was educated in Edinburgh, entered the Scots Guard, and then went up to Oxford. In 1939, he rejoined the Army as a staff major, later became Deputy Judge Advocate, and was knighted on his appointment as Solicitor General in the Coalition Government. After the war, he presented Britain's case against the leading war criminals at Nuremberg. Why did you want the papers of Sir David Maxwell Fife? The papers of David Maxwell Fife, your great-grandfather, are a very important collection in our terms. In his own memoirs, he says that he was playing a walk-on part in history, um, and that that meant that he was very well placed to observe the great figures of the age, the Prime Ministers of the day, Churchill, Anthony Eden, Macmillan. Now that is absolutely true, but I think he's being very modest, because not only was he in a very good position to observe them, but he also played, of course, a key role himself um, at several points. He plays a key role at the Nuremberg trials in cross-examining Goering and the leading oven. Nazi figures. Um, he plays a key role in drafting the European Convention on Human Rights. And of course, he holds many of the major offices of state. I mean, this is a man who's Attorney General, Solicitor General, Home Secretary, and Lord Chancellor of the country. So he is playing a major role in the developments that we're seeking to capture here in the archive. If our unfortunate generation has proved one thing, it has demonstrated that the barbarian is not behind us, but always underneath us, ready to rise up.